Hello and thank you for tuning in to this session on Shakespearean comedy. I'm Andna Chohan and I'm from the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon where we take care of the legacy of Shakespeare in his hometown. So to accompany this session <coughs> there is a resource that you can download um, and you can follow what I'm saying uh, by listening and looking at the resource and also the images that appear on the screen. So we're thinking obviously about comedies and what they mean and what makes them unique within the, within the realm of Shakespeare's writing. So the first image that we can see here comes from the 1623 first folio. Now this is a really important book because this is the first time that Shakespeare's complete works are published in one place. So in one book you can access all of his plays, all of his poetry. And one of the first pages that you come across is this catalogue page that we can see here. Now you'll notice that the first um, plays that are listed come under the title of comedies. So we're in this session thinking about what comedy means and what Elizabethan and Jacobean audiences expected from these types of plays. So comedies, as I said before, are unique. That's because they have a very unique structure. And there are things that we expect from comedies um, that are very specific to this genre. And in fact, as well as what we expect from comedies, um, we have to be aware that Elizabethans uh, had different kinds of expectations. Obviously, we always expect comedy to be funny, to be amusing. We expect jokes. We want to laugh at a comedy. And certainly Shakespeare's audiences expected to laugh as well when they see Much Ado About Nothing. They see Dogbury getting all of his words confused. They see Feste making jokes about chevril gloves and things. And this is, this is all designed to get audiences um, feeling involved and laughing along with the characters. So Shakespeare's audience is always expected to be entertained. But what makes Shakespeare's comedies unique, and perhaps comedy in this period unique, is that audiences very often would go to the theatre, to the playhouse, and expect to come away having learnt something. Now that doesn't have to be a profound something, but just something that will help them move on or change um, perhaps their attitude to certain things. <clears throat> so really, the reason that you're laughing at characters is so that you learn how not to behave. So when we laugh at Bottom, for instance, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, we're not laughing because we're being cruel about Bottom and how ridiculous he looks in that pair of ass's ears that he's grown because of the spell that Puck has put on him. We're laughing because we recognise his flaws as a character. And that's really important because audiences, as I said, would always expect to learn from these characters. We are supposed to feel disciplined and exampled from comedy by watching comedies, by learning from the mistakes of these characters. Now we often think that's a trait that's unique to tragedy, and that's not the case at all. We are supposed to be learning from comedy. So we're laughing, but we're laughing for good reason. Now another thing that we always expect in comedies is confusion, or lots of tension. We need something to go horribly wrong in a comedy, so that characters have a problem to overcome. So if we think, for instance, of Much Ado About Nothing, when Claudio believes that his fiancée, Hero, has been unfaithful, he casts her away and leaves her for dead at their wedding ceremony. Now this, it, this creates a whole uh, realm of confusion in the middle of this play. And without that confusion, there wouldn't be any obstacles, there wouldn't be any problems for these characters to overcome. And similarly, in The Tempest, for instance, Shakespeare's penultimate play, the character of Caliban believes that Stefano and Trinculo are somehow gods because they carry alcohol, they've managed to get him drunk. And that confusion is amusing, but it also has a very distinctive function to move us along on that linear journey to get to the resolution. You can't have a resolution or a happy ending without something going wrong in the first place. And of course, another thing that we expect from Shakespeare's comedies is mistaken identity. Now, this comes across in various ways. There's often lots and lots of disguise in the comedies, characters dressing up 
as other characters in, in the comedy of The Merry Wives of Windsor, for instance, the character of Falstaff, the great, enormous character, dresses up as the Witch of Brentford. And it's very funny because he's dressed as a woman and obviously he has an enormous beard and all the characters are laughing and the audience is laughing along with him. But another thing that we get most often in the comedies, particularly comedies like Twelfth Night and As You Like It, we have women who dress up as men. So we have the breeches part. So Viola, for instance, dresses up as a man. And because she's dressed as a man, she resembles her twin brother, Sebastian. Now that creates lots of confusion and chaos within the play because there are characters who mistake Viola for Sebastian and vice versa. And it becomes amusing, it becomes chaotic. And the function of that is to allow the audience to feel slightly superior. If we know the real identities of these characters, then we are somehow one up on all of the characters, all of the actors. And that is something that's called dramatic irony. And that helps the audience feel involved and feel superior within the world of comedy. So mistaken identity is very, very important. And Shakespeare uses that in various ways. Um, we also have twins. So Viola obviously is a twin with Sebastian. But in the comedy of the comedy of errors, for instance, there are various sets of twins. There are in fact um, two different sets of twins that we have running around and all different people are, are sort of confusing each other um, and it's very very funny but again the audience know the real identities of these characters which again makes you feel very superior makes you aware in a way that those characters aren't Something else that we always expect from a comedy is the idea of escapism. Characters might be in horrible situations um, and they desire to escape. So, for instance, Helena and uh, Hermia and Demetrius and Lysander in A Midsummer Night's Dream, they all run away into the forest, into the wood outside of Athens because they seek escape from the Athenian law because Hermia and Lysander are not allowed to marry um, inside Athens itself, so they run away. And the wood outside of Athens becomes a kind of other world, an escapist world. And similarly, Belmont in The Merchant of Venice is an island, is a realm unto itself. So Belmont becomes an escapist world. There are no financial problems. Nobody's broke in Belmont. Everybody has lots of money. Everybody's very, very happy. So we run away there to find a degree of escapism. Another thing that we expect from comedies is a resolution. So a happy ending. Now we can't have a comedy without a happy ending or allegedly we'll think about that in a little in a little while now the reason that a lot of Shakespeare's comedies end with marriages is because in the very literal sense we have people coming together and when people come together and share experiences then we are forming new communities we have a new society and a sense that these people can go on and create a new future a happy future together so a happy ending comes about because we have people coming together and sharing experiences so an example of that comes from A Midsummer Night's Dream. So if we think about the very, the very end of this play, we have Puck who comes on and delivers a little epilogue. But before that, the character of Oberon instructs his fairies to fly around um, the palace and bless everybody in it. So if we think about what Oberon is saying, now until the break of day, through this house each fairy stray, to the best bride bed will we, which by us shall blessed be, and the issue there create, ever shall be fortunate. Now, Oberon, in a very distinctive sense, is rhyming. He is speaking in verse, in, in trochies, tumpty 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 tum, tumpty 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 tum. And it's very comforting as an audience to hear that. And what he's doing um, is being very positive. Look at the language he's using, the break of day, each fairy stray to the best bride bed, which shall, by us shall blessed be, and the issue there creates. So we have a sense of people being married, they have bride beds, they're gonna create children. So we've got a sense of a future. These people will carry on 
living. So this is very positive language, it's very happy. Again, celebrating people coming together in a very literal way. And what's interesting as well is those rhyming couplets, day, stray, we, be, create, fortunate, that rounds off the comedy in a very, very neat way. This is the ending, so we're, we're kind of rhyming. We're about to burst into a great big dance with the whole cast. So this is Shakespeare signalling through language um, the tone of the play. This is happy. It is satisfied. Now, what's interesting about Shakespeare's comedies is that he actually went through various phases of writing them. So. His earlier comedies are sort of getting to grips with the structure of what a comedy should do. And as he progresses throughout his career, he starts to challenge um, the idea of the happy ending. And he starts to question what constitutes a happy ending. If we have lots of marriages, does that make everything okay? Well, in the very early comedy, The Taming of the Shrew, at the very end of this play, the character of Petruchio has tamed his wife, Caterina. And at the end of the play, the character of Hortensio congratulates him and he says, Now go thy ways, thou hast tamed a cursed shrew. And Lucentio, tis a wonder, by your leave, she will be tamed so. So as an audience, we're slightly troubled by what's going on here and we're questioning whether someone like Caterina will in fact be happy spending the rest of her life married to Petruchio. He has, after all, starved her. He has refused to allow her to change her clothes. He's dragged her through the mud, made her walk home to her father's house to attend her sister's wedding feast. It's actually quite ambiguous. And that ambiguity helps us understand what it is that Shakespeare was doing with comedy and comic structures. What makes The Taming of the Shrew very unique is in fact that it has um, an interesting structure. At the end of the play, we have these characters who go off and seemingly have a, a happy ever after, seemingly. But of course, at the beginning of the play, we have this bizarre framework with the character of Christopher Sly, who is horribly drunk, and all the characters around him play this cruel joke on him. And that's how we end up with the play, The Taming of the Shrew. The whole play is in fact a play within a play. So what does that mean when we get to the ending and have all these couples taming one another? Does that mean that's the real ending? Is that a happy ending? How can it be real if it's only a play within another play? So ambiguity is very important. Another indication of why ambiguity is so significant in Shakespeare's works is the fact that we expect people to come together. If we expect people to come together in celebration, a great big dance, and a great big sing song, um, then what happens to characters who are left out? What happens to Shylock at the end of The Merchant of Venice, for instance? What happens to Don Pedro in Much Ado About Nothing? What about Caliban in The Tempest? Do they get a happy ending? And of course, we have the play Twelfth Night with the character Malvolio, the steward, who has this horrible prank played on him when he's shut up in a dark room and he's forced to believe that his mistress is in love with him. But then at the end, he realises it's just a cruel trick. He's humiliated. And before he leaves the stage, he says, I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. Is this what we expect from a comedy? Probably not. And this is again Shakespeare introducing ambiguity. What happens when characters are left out of this happy ending in a comedy? And of course we have ambiguous endings in terms of morality as well. When we think about Much Ado About Nothing, for instance, when Hero marries Claudio, the audience is slightly troubled by this. Claudio has accused Hero on very, very slight evidence of sleeping with another man, and yet he leaves, he leaves her for dead, and yet she agrees to marry him at the end of the play. And Claudio, in fact, never apologises. He doesn't apologise to Hero. So when Hero unmasks herself and says, you were my other husband, and now I am your wife, she says, one Hero died defiled, but I do live, and surely as I live, I am a maid. 
So this is Hero almost asserting herself to Claudio rather than the other way around. And as an audience, we might be slightly perplexed by that. Do we forgive Claudio? Does Hero truly forgive Claudio? And do we believe that they will live happily ever after as we expect them to do? This is, after all, a comedy. So the reason we're thinking about comedies is because they are unique in their structure. They start off with some kind of problem that needs solving and they end with some kind of resolution or at least ostensibly a sense of resolution. But Shakespeare was very, very interested in challenging the structure of comedy and challenging what people expected when they went to, went, went to hear or experience a comedy in the theatre. So remember um, to have a look at the text you're studying and see if you can find areas of ambiguity. Do the characters behave the way you expect them to behave in a comedy? Or do they, as Shakespeare was suggesting, challenge your expectations? Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>